Okay, so we um, learned yesterday about our, t our, the other day, not yesterday, about the um, pressure conversion. We're not going to do anything more with that for now. We'll do something more with that in Chapter 14 later, okay? Um, but now we're just going to talk about kinetic energy and what does it do for molecules and how does that affect the changes of state or the states of matter, okay? So the first one we have is kinetic energy and temperature. Kinetic energy is the energy of movement, right? Um, so when something has a higher temperature, the molecules will move faster, meaning they have a higher kinetic energy. As the substance cools down, the particles will move slower, which results in a drop in their kinetic energy. So since kinetic energy is the energy of movement, when you have a higher temperature, things move faster, and so you have a higher average <coughs> kinetic energy, and then as the temperature decreases, it slows down, and it has a lower temperature, and, or a lower temperature and a lower kinetic energy. That's, excuse me, that's why um, last, like video one or something, we talked about fluids, right? Fluids are the things that are able to flow. What two things are fluids? Gases and liquids. And both of those can move around, right? Can a solid move around like that? Can it flow? No. So as you cool something down, like let's just think about water, right? So we have water vapor, we have water liquid, and we have ice, which is frozen water, water solid, right? So water vapor moves the most, and water vapor usually happens when it's at a very high temperature, like when you're boiling something, boiling the water, right? And then liquid water moves around, but not as chaotically as the water vapor. It has to kind of stick together a little bit and flow around in whatever container it's in. But then when you freeze the water, like if you put it in the freezer and make ice cubes, does the water flow anymore to the, what you can see? No. So it doesn't have as much kinetic energy when you cool that temperature down. Okay. The Kelvin temperature of a substance is directly proportional to the average kinetic energy of the particles of that substance. Directly proportional means that if the temperature goes up, the average kinetic energy goes up. So they move in the same way. If it goes down, the other one goes down as well. Okay? That's just what directly, directly proportional means. And we're going to see that in the next couple chapters. Okay? So this picture um, is kind of showing in a really bad way. But there's arrows and stuff, and that's showing like there's more movement when the temperature goes up versus when the temperature is lower. Liquids, we had number three on the packet to still do. Um, according to the kinetic theory, both particles and gases and liquids have kinetic energy. They move, right? This energy allows for the particles to flow past one another. And by their ability to flow, we call them fluids. So fluid, definition, ability to flow. We've kind of already been talking about that. But liquids have a big difference between gases because they are attracted to one another with what are called intermolecular forces. Okay? Intermolecular forces are the attractions that keep the molecules of liquid close together. They're attracted to one another, and since they're close together, well, that's why we say that liquids have a definite volume. Gases are very far apart, and so they're moving around, and they aren't connected with the intermolecular forces, and so that's why they don't have a definite volume. They take the shape of their container. The interplay be between the disruptive motions of the particles in a liquid and the attraction among them is determined is what determines the physical properties of the liquids. So liquids can be more dense, like gases. They can, there can be some liquids that are more dense than others, um, but it all has to do with the particles and how close together they are. <coughs> it goes in order. I literally copy and paste from the PowerPoint. Yeah. form to the shape of their containers. It's right here. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the different types of, like the words that we call the change between states of matter, okay? 
The first one is called evaporation, or we can also call it vaporization. It means the same thing. This is when you have something goes from a liquid to a gas, okay? We specifically call it evaporation when the liquid is not boiling, so we're not heating it up. It just happens, okay? Vaporization is when you just convert it, so really they're interchangeable. But during evaporation, only the molecules within a certain minimum kinetic energy can escape. So that's why sometimes you have to use heat to aid in the escaping of molecules, okay? Um, because without that, they wouldn't be able to escape. So I would boil water. You may have noticed that a liquid evaporates faster when it's heated, and that's because the heat makes them have higher kinetic energy, and so because of that movement, they're able to break the intermolecular forces that are holding them together, which lets them release into a gas form, okay? So heating it increases the average kinetic energy, gives it more movement, it breaks away the bonds. Vapor pressure is what is called when we have a force exerted by a gas above a liquid, okay? The vapor pressure of a liquid in a closed system differs from in an open system. In a closed system, so like this is a picture of like a terrarium or like a botanical garden or something like that, um, the resulting gas will collide with the walls of the closed container and create a pressure inside, and it's something easily measured. But in an open system, like if you have like a lake or something, then the resulting gas is free to travel wherever it takes, wherever it wants to go. And so because it's able to travel, it's actually harder to measure the vapor pressure. Over time, the number of particles entering the vapor increases, and some of the particles will condense and return to the liquid state. So we need to write the equation that summarizes this, okay? Where, if we're going between a liquid and a gas, which also could be called a vapor, vapor is just when it's normally at liquid at room temperature. That's the reason why it's called vapor. Uh, we have this funky little arrow that's called an equilibrium arrow, where it's like the half arrows that we saw back in chapter five, but they're sideways. And one will point to the right, and the other one will point to the left. That's called an equilibrium arrow, okay? Where the top arrow <coughs> represents the liquid turning into a gas, and that one would be called evaporation. Okay, so the liquid evaporates into a gas. But then to go back the other way, from a gas to turn back into a liquid, that would be our, called our condensation. Or we could say like a gas is condensing down into a liquid. So that's why when you have a water bottle and you let it sit for a while, some of the water that's in there will actually turn into a gas or vapor form. But then it will condense back down. So that's why like at the top of the water bottle you might see the liquid, like the water droplets on the top where there isn't like a whole body of water underneath it. And that's because some of the vapor turns back into the liquid form, but it's caught wherever it's located, like on the edges of the bottle, okay? Eventually, the number of gas particles will equal the number of liquid particles, and we say that this will result in a constant vapor pressure, meaning that this is a circular motion. So it will continue to change back and forth and continue and continue and continue. It doesn't stop the process, it just stops to our eyes of what we see, okay? That's what equilibrium is. In a system at constant vapor pressure, a dynamic equilibrium <coughs> exists between the vapor and the liquid. And so we say that it's in equilibrium because the rate of evaporation is equal to the rate of the condensation, okay? The rates are equal to each other. So then when they're equal to each other, to us, we don't see anything, but it's still actually happening quite a bit, okay? That's something that's just hard to think about. Okay, so we talked about vapor pressure and how it works. Now let's compare it to the temperature changes. So an increase in temperature of a contained liquid will increase the vapor pressure because if you're increasing the temperature, it's moving more, so it can break the bonds more, and so it can move around faster than it did when it was in liquid form. So warm particles have greater kinetic energy. 
As a result, more of the particles will reach a minimum kinetic energy, and they'll escape the surface of liquid and become a gas <laughs> instead. Okay? Um, so this picture is just showing that the dots are just the particles escaping, and there's more particles escaping at a higher temperature than at a lower pressure. A lower temperature, sorry. We can measure vapor pressure in what's called a manam man manameter. Sorry, doesn't say that twice. Um, but we don't use those in chemistry, especially in Chem 1, because we could just be given data to know that vapor pressure. Okay? Boiling point happens when we change from a liquid to a gas, okay? When a liquid is heated to a temperature at which the particles throughout the liquid have enough kinetic energy to vaporize, the liquid begins to boil. So when you have a pot of water on the stove, like you're making pasta, and you're waiting for it to boil, and then you start to see the bubbles form in the liquid before even, even before they escape to the surface, inside those bubbles are little packets of water vapor. It's not air, it's little packets of water vapor. It's just they haven't been able to reach the surface to break apart yet. It doesn't have enough energy to float to the top, okay? Um, but so those bubbles contain just vapor water, water vapor. The boiling point is the temperature at which the vapor pressure is equal to the external pressure on the liquid. Um, so that's just a fancy way of saying that because the pressures are equal to each other, that's how the vapor can escape out of the liquid, okay? Because the liquid boils when its vapor pressure equals the external pressure, liquids don't always boil at the same temperature. That's why, like, sometimes when you're cooking, if you look like on a box of like a cake mix box or something, it'll say at higher elevations, use this temperature instead. And that's because the pressure, the, the atmospheric pressure on the outside has an effect on this vapor, the boiling pressure, or the boiling point and the vapor pressure. And so, because atmospheric pressure is lower at higher altitudes, the boiling points decrease, and so you usually cook it at a lower temperature. So, next time you look at a cake mix, or a cookie mix, or brownie mix, check and see what that says. Boiling is a cooling process. Just like how our bodies sweat to cool, we release our sweat to try and cool ourselves down. Um, boiling is also a cooling process similar to evaporation because since the water molecules that are in vapor form have a lot more energy, they're moving around more so they're creating more heat. And so in order to cool itself down, they want to escape those vapor particles or the vapor molecules so that it can go back to a lower temperature. So during boiling, particles in the highest kinetic energy escape first when the liquid is at the boiling point. So applying more heat will allow for more particles to release because they have higher kinetic energy. However, the temperature of the boiling liquid never rises above its boiling point. It only boils faster if more heat is applied. So once, like, if we were boiling water and pure water boils, does anybody know what pure water boils at? 100 <coughs> degrees Celsius or 212 degrees Fahrenheit, right? So if we were boiling water and we put the thermometer in and it was boiling, it should stay at that temperature. If we kept it boiling for like five minutes, it's not going to go above 100. It might a little bit if it's not pure water, but it's just going to keep boiling, keep boiling, keep boiling until all of the water liquid is gone. That's all. That's what this is saying is it's not going to raise the temperature. Like you might think, hey, it's going to go up to like 110. It's not. It's going to stay at 100 degrees Celsius because that's the temperature at which it boils. The steam that's coming off might be hotter. Has anybody ever heard of like getting a steam burn before? Like, you have to be careful sometimes, like when you're, like, after you cook noodles and then you're pouring off the liquid, then that could potentially burn you. Like, I've heard, I've had students before who've come in from work and they have steam burns on their hands because it's been so hot. But the steam can have a higher temperature, the, the, the vapor can have a higher temperature, but the actual liquid will not, okay? So we have something that's called normal boiling points. Um, these are just showing that different liquids have different boiling points. Is defined as the boiling point of a liquid at a pressure of 101.3 kPa, excuse me, or one atmosphere. So that'd be the pressure of like the atmosphere at sea level. So um, if you can't, if you have a hard time, the first one, carbon disulfide, is 
degrees Celsius chloroform is 61.7 degrees Celsius methanol is 64.7 carbon tetrachloride is 76.8 ethanol is 78.5 and water is 100 um, so all of the ones below 100 a below water that just means that it's going to be turning into a gas a lot sooner than water is so actually like the carbon disulfide, the chloroform, and the methanol, those are all like basically room temperature, you know? Like, I don't keep my house much colder in the wintertime than 61 degrees Celsius. So that means that these are probably going to be right on the cusp of being only gases all the time at room temperature, or maybe they're sometimes liquids, but mostly time, most of the time gases, okay, um, at room temperature. So the boiling point just kind of shows us when they actually turn.